So, um, my brief is to talk to you uh, for 20 minutes about the solar component of the vision on the right. We know that we're on the artist's impression road to the left on the way to six degrees, um, and somehow we have to figure a way of getting to that general road on the right. That said, I think all of us in this room would agree we can do a lot better than the artist's impression of what solar looks like there. Um, and I want to quickly tour through what it looks like and feels like on this very fast-growing, vibrant industry, which is not a magic bullet. There are no magic bullets, but it's a vital piece in getting to the um, low-carbon road. And for me, there are 12 issues that need to be addressed and I'll, I'll go through them quickly one by one. I won't uh, go through them now, but I'll explain each as I get to them. So obviously you want real carbon savings. I mean, there are energy technologies out there that say they save carbon, but actually don't when you look at energy return on energy invested. Solar does pretty well, not perfectly. There is a fairly appreciable payback time still measured in a couple of years for crystalline silicon. But once you've got your solar up, and this is a low, income housing development of Scottish and Southern with our solar century roof tiles on the roofs, it provides all the electricity that the houses in that development need and much more besides with plenty left over to charge the battery car. Of course, in a few years time, these wires would be going both ways. You wouldn't just be charging the car, you'd be using the car as a power plant, one of your tools. Uh, but also just in passing, apropos our last talk, um, there are four separate renewable energy technologies on site on this development, ground source, air source, heat pump, solar thermal, and a wood chip boiler, all of which can do the entirety of the heating for the airtight building. So, okay, this is new build, and I recognize the challenge is retrofit, but this is a genuinely zero carbon development. It's not far outside London. It's been up for a couple of years. Green Watt Way, for those of you who don't uh, know it. And this is the kind of thing that companies like mine can do with the right partners um, if we're given the chance. Um, and it's not just about electricity from solar, it's about heating as well. These are solar thermal roof tiles, the lighter ones, solar electric are the darker ones. And each of these roofs is saving 1.8 uh, tons of carbon dioxide a year. And as you all know, um, buildings are more than half the carbon emissions uh, in a country like the UK. Now, solar obviously isn't just about residential buildings, or for that matter, commercial buildings. It's about the ground and utility scale as well. These are solar century installations on the ground in the UK, and there are more of, more of these going out at the moment. So we can contribute at the utility scale. Uh, and these kinds of scale installations, up to five megawatts, are going on commercial roofs as well as we speak under the rock regime. And we've reached the point as an industry now where we do figure materially in models for deep cuts in emissions. So here you see the work of Block and others um, uh, in ECOFIS and some of the Dutch universities published last summer in Nature magazine. This is the best we will get if governments stick to all their commitments at the moment. They're not going to, of course, they're, we're weaseling out left, right and centre. That is the worst case analysis where the emissions just keep on growing. Um, and this, of course, is the net result of the failure of Copenhagen. This is what we need to do if we want to get on the trajectory of the two degrees Celsius target, which so many people think is the danger threshold we can't go beyond. Uh, and this Dutch team have calculated that there are 21 wedges of strategies that you can deploy to get onto that path. And one of them is 1,600 gigawatts of PV by 2020. Now, keep that figure in mind because We'll come back to something like that as I go through. Uh, and as I say, not a magic bullet, there are none, but a material part in the short term of what can be done to cut carbon dioxide. You need to be growing fast to do this, and of course we are. This is the, pig the, the picture from the IPCC report of um, 2011 showing the growth rates of all the renewable energy technologies. Um, most of them are doing pretty well, but solar PV is doing spectacularly. Uh, and another point to make in passing here, I'm sure everyone here appreciates it, but it's worth registering for people who don't know the energy scene too well. 
we are now the renewables almost at the same level globally in terms of the new um, generation capacity added each year. A lot of people don't understand that. They think we're so far behind that we can't really uh, contribute. Of course, we are still a long way behind. It's uh, 6% um, globally, but more than that now, but still a long way to go. But these are very fast growth rates. And of course, as these technologies grow, so many of them follow a, a form of Moore's law, and this is the German price for um, systems installed through to the second quarter of 2006. It's gone even lower since then. This is a 65% decrease, percent decrease in average price um, uh, since the second quarter of 2006 through to the second quarter of 2012. Quite remarkable progress by progressive government policymaking, basically. We need um, capital to be flowing in, and of course we have lived through, uh, arguably are still living through, the worst recession in a century. And yet look at the flow of funds into capital, into clean energy. More than a quarter of a trillion dollars, most of it to renewables, not energy efficiency. Not that I'm saying that's a good thing, but you know there's plenty more can go into energy efficiency. These are the growth rates that we've seen. Um, and renewables really are now giving conventional energy a run for their money. This is the families, the main families of renewables, and here you see solar mapped out for you. For 2000, in 2011, solar was almost half of all the clean energy investment that was being deployed. And when you listen to things like a senior member of the Saudi royal family freaked out, as they all are in Saudi Arabia, by the rate at which they're burning oil in electric power plants, saying, um, as you would have seen perhaps a couple of months ago, that in his view, he thinks so, uh, Saudi Arabia needs to go 100% renewables and ergo mostly solar within his lifetime in order to stop this ruinous erosion of their export potential. Uh, he's 67 years old. Now, what to me is even more remarkable about this is that here, at this point, the average stock prices of solar companies started collapsing. And you can see all the other stock indices are sort of generally showing some kind of weak recovery. But that point was where the quite high values post credit crunch and financial crisis had a bit of recovery, but then they started to collapse. And I wonder if you just pause for a minute and think what happened there in December 2009. That was the Copenhagen Climate Summit. That was the point at which the incumbency was able to turn around and really undermine confidence in this technology. Few constraints on development, and of course, uh, there's a value chain here that essentially for crystalline silicon involves melting sand, so we're doing pretty well on that front. There may be some issues for thin film, but that's still a minority of what's going on. The fuel that we need is, of course, in abundant supply. And here you see the world's best solar market in Germany, an up, up and coming one in the UK. And if you want to have a little bit of a giggle about the kind of nonsense that the incumbency plants in the media, have a look on YouTube at their economics correspondent explaining, uh, you can just Google the key words here, why the American uh, continent is so poorly placed for um, the solar resource and why Germany is doing so well. And her response to that question is because Germany is a much sunnier country than the United <laughs> States. Of course, as you look at the insulation map, the only place that's as bad as Germany is the far northwest around Seattle. So economic sense, uh, unlike the economics correspondent on Fox News, um, this is really a fabulous story. If you like innovation and you're on the cutting edge like a company might, like mine is, this is a great challenge and a great opportunity. And it's not just, this cost down that I've been talking about is not just about uh, manufacturing scale uh, in China and other places. It's all about the balance of systems. So now at least half of the price and cost down that we are achieving to stay competitive is coming from the kinds of things that a company like Solar Century can do in the balance of systems. And all this has finally been picked up by the um, Conoscenti in the consulting class. So this is a very important report by McKinsey last year, Solar Power Darkest Before the Dawn. I like that title. 
Uh, and they basically say, remember the figure I showed you before, uh, 1,000 gigawatts of economic, fully economic solar PV by 2020 is now pretty much inevitable. Now, that's economic potential, that's not deployment potential because they recognize that there is an incumbency to overcome, but I really recommend this report if you don't know it. They talk about the unstoppability of the systemic cost down in this industry, and they say it will transform the face of the global energy industry. Uh, and of course, BP and Shell and others are normally the biggest clients that an entity like McKinsey has, but they're still capable of uh, saying it like it is. And here you see uh, a snapshot of where we are with the levelized cost of electricity and some of the PV uh, families here. Uh, and this is what we're, we're shooting at. Nuclear, well, they have to put this in. It's rubbish, of course, because everything has been shoveled off the balance sheets to get that figure. But coal and gas, we're getting closer and closer. And these are the things to look at. The, this is the annual increase and this is the annual cost down here. So these two um, price points are moving towards each other fast, and McKinsey makes the point that by mid-decade, uh, in multiple markets, almost whatever happens, solar photovoltaics is actually going to be cheaper than conventional energy, any form of conventional energy. So we do have the economics on our side. Uh, we're also going to need the policy speed, and I won't have time to talk about this very much, but some of you may know I'm, uh, my company is in the industry task force on peak oil and energy security. Virgin, Arab, Scottish and Southern and others are in that. And to cut a long story short, a long and complicated story short, because it's a very different narrative we have to the incumbency narrative, we believe, we hope we're wrong, that we're heading for a 1% or thereabouts per annum net depletion. And this includes all the huff and puff that you hear about shale gas and shale oil in the United States. Um, and that this will cause a great global energy crisis and it will happen on your watch. Uh, if we're right or even halfway right, it will be the single biggest parameter, arguably, of your working lives. Uh, and so uh, all I can hope to do with this chart, if you don't know about this ongoing systemic risk debate, have a look at it, because if I want you to remember one thing from what I'm um, um, blathering on about this afternoon, it, it is actually probably this. But uh, there are other problems elsewhere in the energy world. If you're not following the drama of the unraveling of EDF and Areva, uh, effectively ministries of the French state going bankrupt, just have a look at what's happening in Olka, Lyoto, and Flamanville. I have a website, which I'll give you a link to at the end. You can, you can follow um, the story in recent years of how the cost is going through the roof and the uh, completion times are going off the scale. Uh, these are ministries of the French state that are heading for a state of bankruptcy, and this is an industry that is dying um, outside of India and China, perhaps one or two other countries, very painfully, very messily, and very expensively. So, um, by their own admission, of course, even if they were ultimately able to build this next generation of nuclear plants, it would be 10 years from um, commissioning or from starting the project to turning on the electricity. Many of us just don't believe that anymore, but that, by their own admission, is a decadal timescale. Now, we uh, and our brothers and sisters in the clean energy industries can put up buildings like this in a matter of weeks with the right partners and off-site construction and all the rest of it. Here's a solar century roof in Berlin. Um, were it crystalline, it would be about a megawatt, but it's thin film. Um, here are some of the vital statistics. Thousands of modules, ki kilometers of string cable, uh, and not very nice uh, installation conditions. The entire process from uh, beginning to end took us 10 weeks. So this is why they're beginning to fear us. Uh, and the next question is, can we really, I mean, are we kidding ourselves? Can renewables really run modern economies like this? And again, here in the industry, we're very bullish. Um, to emphasize, you know, this is definitely an area where solar needs its brothers and sisters, and there are plenty of them. There are 50 families of clean tech in um, electric power and motive power that excite venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. Uh, we're just one of them. But just have a look at this. Christmas Day and Boxing Day in Germany. This is what the Germans are dealing with now, with their 27 gigawatts of um, installed uh, solar capacity. 
Uh, and this is what the modelers are producing based on this kind of performance. This is a great team out of Stanford and um, one of the other Californian universities, Berkeley. Uh, I commend this paper to you if you don't know it. This is their modeling of what a typical day in July would look like in California in 2020. And you can see the mix by which the whole thing would be completely renewably powered, a modern Californian uh, economy. And they've done this for the whole world for an 11 and a half terawatt world, and they've broken it right down to their particular mix. I mean, this, isn't, uh, this is just a scenario. It could be done other ways. Notice they haven't even used biomass and biofuels. This is just all water technologies and solar and wind. And the key thing about this, the real killer about this, is that to achieve something like this as early as 2030, we wouldn't have to mobilize any technology any faster than other technologies have already been mobilized in the history of technical commerce. The Germans have gone a bit beyond modeling. They've actually done scaled experiments. If you don't know the Combi Kraftwerk experiment of 2006, this ran a real German economy uh, by hooking up real renewable power plants around the nation at a 10 thousandths of the real demand scale. Uh, most of it PV and wind, a bit of biogas generators, uh, and very little storage. Of course, in a 100% renewable powered economy, there would be storage. But the conclusion, Ministry of Economy um, study with a number of companies involved, is this is all doable. And we can run the railways. You hear the nuclear people say, you, you can't run the railways with renewables. Rubbish. Tell that to the Germans. Deutsche Bahn, if you'll pardon the pun, has targets and timetables for running the, the German railways entirely on renewables. And we need jobs because we've got to rebuild our economies. Um, ideally, it used to be a problem if you had uh, too much of a labor-intensive uh, technology on your hands. These days, it's a positive advantage. Um, and of course, this is job-rich territory. This is the Solar Century team, a downstream company. Here are some of the roofers that we're training to uh, transition. Uh, a typical comment from one of these lads on one of the, the videos, it's just like normal roofing with wires. And it isn't just about the developed world, of course. We absolutely have to um, do development with these technologies. They have to be applicable for the developing world. And um, my own company has sort of tried to take a tilt at this remarkable picture which shows you where all the sun is shining, and it's not in Germany and the UK, obviously. Um, the real sun belt is here, and this is where the lights aren't on. This is the famous image of the Earth at night, compound image showing you where the lights are on and where the lights are off, uh, and that's where the sun is during the day. So we set up a charity called Solar Aid with 5% of our profits, and what we do is simply sell solar lanterns in Africa, in four countries. Uh, and we go through schools, we think we found a channel, uh, and we started in 2006, Sunny Money, the retail brand, which is for profit but endlessly recycled profits, now has franchises all over these four countries. Here are the sales stats. Absolutely incredible growth this year. We're now the biggest solar light retailer on the continent of Africa, operating in just four countries. This is what could be done with solar energy um, in development. Um, and if you get the chance to look at Newsnight um, last night, or maybe some of you might have seen it, there was a little bit of coverage of this and an interview uh, with a young lad who um, came 55th in Kenya in, in his exams. And he was asked, unprompted, what uh, had been a factor in all this. He said the single biggest factor was I had this light and I could do three hours extra homework a night. So uh, building security is very important. Um, the, the, the incumbencies are going uh, further and further into harm's way. I mean, if you just look at some of the transcripts coming out of the trial now, BP has chosen to go to trial. Uh, and all its dirty washing will be aired yet again just to maybe save a few billion in the judge's award. Just have a look, if you're not following it, at some of the stuff that's coming out. And you, th you think what these people are up to, and they say that they can frack safely under Surrey. I don't trust them, and I don't believe them, and neither should you. Uh, but it's also about financial security. 
Uh, this is a roof on a farmer's home in the Pyrenees. He, called it, he calls it his pension. And of course, uh, the argument there is the hedge against the future inflation of electricity prices. You factor your own square in the Excel spreadsheet in as to what you think the inflation of electricity prices are going to be if we stay with conventional forms of energy and you very soon come to pension-like figures for the savings you're going to make. Very good investment. I think the next two are very, very important. We have a hope problem on our hands. Any of you who went to Copenhagen and had to deal with any of these young people um, after the failure of the summit, uh, I took the boat back from Copenhagen um, uh, stacked with student demonstrators who'd been uh, treated appallingly, kept out in the cold, um, sitting in rows for no particular reason by the robocop-like Danish police, um, and then had to stomach the, the dreadful performance of these people in the summit. So you take that into schools and, you know, we really do have a challenge of offering young people hope. Um, and solar's great for that. I mean, we know this on the front lines. We've done now hundreds and hundreds of schools, and it's not just about clunky stuff on the roof. It's about how you can structure lessons around the different vision of how this vaguely magical process works and provides really workable amounts of electricity, the way that electricity parlays into some of the other things we've, we've heard talked about here, motive power, uh, and the, the lessons for heat as well. And it's for the developing world as well. This is a school, an opening of a, um, a solar school that SolarAid did in Kenya. And I've already told you the story about the little lad who came 50, 55th in Kenya. But actually, we now have anecdotal evidence from multiple schools across Kenya that the average grades generally in these schools are going up with uh, the solar systems that we have. And my final point is incumbency survivability, because you know, I've been uh, in the energy business one way or another now for getting on for a quarter of a century. I've never seen anything as vaguely demented as what's going on at the moment. It feels very much like a civil war to me. And um, I'm reminded of, of tales I get told by my father and my uncles about how in the Second World War the worst fighting was you know, towards the end in places like Okinawa and uh, Berlin. And these guys are really taking no prisoners now. They, they, they see an existential, uh, f an existential threat from renewables and solar, and they are reacting in a sort of programmed, enculturated way. I don't think it's a conspiracy. I actually think it's a human cultural problem. Their defense is so deadly. Uh, and I could tell you a whole book about this, but let me just give you a few snapshots. If you don't know this already, in DEC, up to 50, DEC and BIS, uh, up to 50 big energy lobbyists have deployed at any one time, uh, effectively as officials on secondment. Now, these guys are not arguing for solar. There's, we have one now, one solar industry official in there. We know from this leaked correspondence from the Treasury to DEC from Mr. Osborne, we're paraphrasing, but paraphrasing accurately, he said, uh, you know, you can have two rocks for offshore wind, but that's it. We then have to put the lid on renewables because if we don't, we put off the gas investors that we need to um, turn UK into a gas hub and replicate the gas, the shale gas boom that they have been enjoying in uh, Texas and other American states. Shell at one time looked as though it was being vaguely um, progressive about all this. They and BP have both pulled out of solar completely, just as it's getting interesting. Um, and their view of the future is shale gas, unconventional gas, unconventional oil, tar sands, all the rest of it. Uh, they're recarbonizing, mm, uh, just as we get firmly on a road to six degrees Celsius. Yet they can run two-day courses for senior civil servants, as we know, under the Freedom of Information Act, and they turn up. We can't do that in the renewables industry. This is legalized corruption, basically. Uh, and I'm informed by multiple sources inside Whitehall, uh, right up to ministerial level, and from officials, that gas lobbyists, at uh, one time, the gas industry's mantra was, you know, we need gas, we need renewables together. In fact, 
gas and solar work very well together when you see them operating. But their lobbyists behind the wire are under the radar lobby to kill renewables. They're telling um, government and they're getting receptive ears that actually what we need is gas. We're going to frack the hell out of Surrey and Lancashire and everywhere else. We're going to replicate this uh, boom experience that they've had in the States. We're going to ignore all the indications that that itself is some kind of Ponzi scheme because the amount of debt you need to prop up the rapidly um, failing wells and that is going to be the future. And so every time we have a slight hiccup, too windy for wind turbines, straight on the front page of the tabloid press, too windy for wind turbines, the shock and horror of an exploding wind turbine on uh, the Daily Mail's front pages, national news. And this is the other um, part of their narrative cooked up by whoever their PR agencies are, you know, Burson Marsteller or uh, one of the others. Um, your, your electricity and gas bills are going up because of all this dreadful green stuff, not because of the wholesale price of gas, but because of you know, feeding tariffs and all that kind of nonsense. So we have to survive this. We have to defeat it. I'm optimistic that we will. Um, but uh, it, this will slow down the inevitable that McKinsey talk about. And that's from my report from the front lines of the solar revolution. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs>